والمؤمنين والمؤمنات ثواب الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين ولعن الله ولا الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والفجر وليال عشر والشفع والوتر والليل إذا يسر هل في ذلك قسم لذي حجر ألم تر كيف فعر ربك بعاد إرم ذات العماد التي لم يخلق مثلها في البلاد وثمود الذين جابوا الصخر بالواد وفرعون ذي الأوتاد الذين طغوا في البلاد فأكثر فيها الفساد فصب عليهم ربك صوت عذاب إن ربك لب من صاد فأما الإنسان إذا مبتلاه ربه فأكرمه ونعمه فيقول ربي أكرما وأما إذا مبتلاه فقدر عليه رزقه فيقول ربي أهانا كلا بل لا تكرمون اليتيم ولا تحاضون على طعام المسكين وتأكلون التراث أكلا لما وتحبون المال حبا جما كلا إذا دكت الأرض دكا دكا وجاء ربك والملك صفا صفا وجيء يومئذ بجهنم يومئذ يتذكر الإنسان وأن له الذكرى يقول يا ليتني قدمت لحياتي فيومئذ لا يعذب عذابه أحد ولا يوثق وثاقه أحد يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي سلوات Most of our age, my respected elders and brothers and sisters, أعظم الله وجولنا وأجولكم بمصابنا أبي عبد الله الحسين سيد الشهداء صلوات الله وسلامه عليه Tonight is the night of Ashura, and therefore that makes tomorrow the day, and the following night will be Shami Gariban, which therefore brings us to the conclusion of these mournful periods of night, being the first Ashura. But therefore it also gives us an understanding that we are about to enter into a new phase of mourning thereafter as well. We have many amongst us who are younger brothers and sisters, and therefore it bears well that we spend the first couple of minutes tonight, inshallah, just mentioning some of the etiquettes of tonight and tomorrow. Because many of us will be experiencing this consciously for the first time. And many of us will be making more and more efforts as the years go by to understand the movement of Karbala. And therefore, as that growth takes place within us, as our appreciation comes to the point that this is not a ritual, this is life and death itself, then we will come to the understanding of the value of tonight and tomorrow, insha'Allah. So with tonight being the night of Ashura, there will be much time, insha'Allah, for us to express our grief and understand what took place upon this blessed night. As we just heard the announcement that the center will be available, insha'Allah, for us to mourn what happened to the master of the martyrs, his blessed family, his blessed companions upon these forthcoming hours. I would humbly recommend as highly as possible that we participate in this particular program. 
it does not necessarily just have to be in this one center. Of course, we are here and we want to congregate with the brothers and sisters and make the most of this Husseiniyah. But as we do depart, as we do go home, do not think that we can just go home to enter into our beds. Maybe there is more that we can do tonight to understand. Maybe there is a verse of Quran we can pick up and ponder deeply upon. Maybe there is that Salat al-Layl that I have wanted to be reciting many times throughout these last 10 nights and I have not found the opportunity to do it as such yet. And therefore maybe there is no excuse tonight as tomorrow will be a great day when we are mourning. We are not at work, we are not at school. And therefore an extra 20 minutes tonight may bring something new within us. Tonight is a night for deep reflection. We will at one stage insha'Allah with my memory allowing us to mention a few things about the night of Ashura that has taken place 1400 years ago. And we mentioned on a previous night that the night of Ashura was split up into four for the master of the martyrs. The first quarter was that he spent it for his time between himself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second quarter of the night was that he spent it between himself and his family members. The third between himself and his companions. And the fourth was that he ensured that this night had time for his own self. If on this night, if on this night where the grandest night in history is about to proceed, then we can understand that maybe we too can replicate what the master of the martyrs did upon this very same night. That is the night. Tomorrow being the day, we must adorn ourselves in true grief for this event that has taken place. We must understand what it must have been like upon that day to have witnessed the closest friends and family to yourself one by one departing. And therefore with that comes a true understanding of the level of the grief that the Imam must have been going through. We should not spend tomorrow engaged in anything to do with dunya. We should not engage in any way where we would be laughing, joking, smiling at each other. For my young brothers and sisters, this is of imperative understanding. When our Imams engaged upon this day, on the 10th of Muharram, there was nothing that could be seen other than floods of tears coming from the Masters. Their companions would sit and ask them about this day, and they would remind them of the great tragedy. They would call speakers from afar. They would pay poets to come and recite the tragedies of Ali al Akbar, of Ali al Azgar, and so on and so forth. The Imam did not engage in anything other than remembering the master of the martyrs tomorrow. And therefore, we too should ensure that we replicate this in the very best of manners. And that means updating our methodology in regards to us rejecting anything to do with the outside world on this day. We have a new form of technology. We have a new means to engage with the outer world. We have Twitter, we have our Facebook, we have our email accounts, we have our cell phones, we have our text messages. Maybe, just maybe, on this one day we can understand that the grief of this master supersedes everything else that will take place tomorrow. And therefore, although we may have all these other forms of technology, we may have all these other forms of communication with the outside world. If we can, if there is no need to be engaging with those other forms, then indeed we should try to remove those impediments from remembering the master of the martyrs. The last thing we want is to be engaging in the true death and life of that man and our text message being received from someone at school or work which does not have any bearing upon this day. We have moved to the 21st century and therefore our grief must be understood in accordance with the realms of the 21st century. So I ask my younger brothers and sisters to take a real account of themselves tonight and tomorrow. Engage in this morning. Understand what it must have been like. If you yourself had to give your six-month-old child tomorrow, if you yourself saw your father having arrow upon arrow embedded into his body, you would not be smiling. You would not be greeting each other in the same way. There would not be a moment's respite that your heart would have. And therefore, my young brothers and sisters, as tonight develops, as you hear of the night that takes place, 
as you hear of the martyrdom of Ali ibn al-Azhar, as you hear what happens to Aba Abdullah, bring yourself to Karbala. Allow yourself to be moved to the point where you close your eyes and you take a deep breath and it's as if you feel the gust of wind from the plains of Karbala take you to that point in which you are envisaging, envisaging what took place. Having now said this, we can move, inshallah, towards the verses and conclude our chapter of Surah Al-Fajr. We have done a lot of study, inshallah, on Surah Al-Fajr. And we started it with a tradition from our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, sallallahu alayhi wa In which he says to us that he who recites Surah Al-Fajr, in either his obligatory or in his mustahab prayers, he, inshallah, will be raised with the master of the martyrs on the day of judgment to be alongside him in that very sta- same stage of paradise. Now here we almost become circular. We started with this point. But I want you to introspect at this moment. When we stated those words, and we said that the master himself, the sixth imam, says you will be raised alongside the master of the martyrs, to be with him in the same level of paradise. Did you connect those words with Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna irji'i ira rabbiki radiyatan marbiya You see the imam is called back at that point with those words. Enter into my heaven, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Not any other heaven, enter into my heaven. And therefore when you become circular in that understanding, when you see the sixth Imam says, recite this surah in your prayers, for you should be raised alongside him in that very same station. It is not just an ordinary station. We are going to die that death of Mutma'inna. We will be raised with the death, we will be raised with the raising of Nafsar Mutma'inna. And therefore, that heaven that we enter into is nothing short as the nafs that is worthy of entering into the Jannah for the one who is Mutma'in. You see that whole chapter becomes circular now. All of a sudden it bears a different weight of understanding when I go and stand and I recite that very same chapter. How many of us thought and connected those two dots? So clear, so obvious, yet maybe we can ponder more upon this chapter to have reached that conclusion if we ourselves did not. When you look at the chapter, broadly now, broadly speaking, you find that this chapter takes an interesting series of parallels. What we mean by parallels is that there are mirror images here between one and another. For example, we find in the opening chapter, in the opening part of the chapter, it prevents us with a group of qasam, group of oaths. But yet these oaths we stated are in regards to the masters themselves. It may be in regards to the ten nights of Muharram. It may be in regards to the 14 infallibles. But either way, these qasam are in regards to the beautiful leaders that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has presented for us. At the same time, thereafter, subsequent to those oaths, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents us with tyrannical leaders. Therefore, at some stage, you can recognize there is a parallel taking place. There is one another looking at each other. Then as the verse continues we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents us with that other parallel. On another night, we talked about the one that is tested with rizq being given to him. And then there is another who is tested with rizq being taken away from him. Do you not see a parallel being presented between these two again? One has been given, one has been taken away. Let us see your reactions from both sides when you are strong and when you are weak. There is a parallel here. And then at the end of the chapter... It now provides us with an issue about hell and heaven. It says to us that on that day that the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come, that the angels will come forward, hell itself will be brought forward, and at that point, then mankind will remember. But O oh man, what good will it do for you now to remember the sins that you have committed? Why did you not remember them when we gave you your 70 years of life? Why did you not perform istighfar at that point? Why did you not do tawbah at that point? Why do you remember hell only when hell is brought in front of you? But then having described hell and all of the atrocities placed within it, all of the difficulties that will be bearing for those people who are flung into the pits of hell, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents us another parallel. 
He says, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna, irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan maradiyya. Look at the difference here. On one side, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows you all the realms of hell. But on another side, He shows you all the realms of deep spirituality and the conclusion being the pearly gates of heaven itself. Another parallel for you and I to see. So here we must understand this hell and we must understand nafsul mutma'inna. Hell, we want to give you just one tradition. It's not... We don't want to focus on hell. We want to focus on nafsul mutma'inna. But one for the sake of clarity of this. There is a tradition that is revealed, or rather the tafsir of those verses of hell, from the very chapter. It is a story, it is a hadith that says that on the day of judgment, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides where to place people, where to go and put people, he will now want to show you what hell itself is really like. This will affect everybody from all of us, from the first to the last, good, bad, and all in between. The hadith says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will beckon for hell to be brought forward. A thousand angels will use chains in order to pull the hell towards mankind. From the first to the last. At that point, the hellfire will breathe and explode in such a way that its sound will destroy people. It will make us become destroyed at that point. And to the extent that right now, that very hell that is in existence, had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not covered that sound from the ears of humanity, it would be destroying us right now. It continues. And at that point, the hellfire will circumambulate around all of mankind. And mankind will cry out, Nafsi, nafsi, not I, not I. Save me, save me. That is one description of the hellfire. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all from that. And that point comes... To understand that this is a real hellfire. This is something that we are told will definitely take place. This is the reality of what will be presented in front of us. How will I bear on the day of judgment when I am told that my deeds were not worthy of being put into the other place? And at that point, we come to the realization that Allah presents us with the parallel. He shows us that as much as there is this place... And maybe, just maybe, that place should be reserved only for the Fir'auns of each community. But therefore, the ones who object to the Fir'aun, the ones who actively work against the Fir'aun, if the Fir'aun is going to be flung into that place, surely the one who objects to him, the one who works against him, will be placed within the pearly gates of heaven. Thus the beautiful parallel that is presented to us. Nafsul mutma'inna. Let us understand this. And we want to present three facets of what it might be to have and own a nafsul mutma'inna. This soul that is purely contented by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Interestingly enough, we find another parallel here, do we not? The fact that I am pleased with him. The means is another parallel that he is also pleased with me at the very same time. There is a beautiful parallel system that is taking place within Surah Al-Fajr for us to see. I am pleased with him and he is well pleased with me. My soul is completely content. My soul is to the point where I am satisfied with everything and anything that has been placed before me. There cannot be a moment where I am corrupted. There cannot be a moment where my mind is separated from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At that point, I am nothing more than completely in unison with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. This is nafsul mutma'inna. We are told, Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'inna al qulub. That the way to reach, reach this very lofty point, surely by the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are the hearts contented. Now, think about this for a moment. I would like to present you with a practical amal, if you don't mind. I would like to present you with something practical for you to take away, inshaAllah, with you. You are all listening to me. Inshallah. And there's a delayed reaction, so maybe you're not listening. 
Insha'Allah, you are all listening to me. And I am speaking. And at that point, our minds, insha'Allah, are meeting. We're not going to hermeneutics, don't worry. We are meeting at the point of understanding each other. I am expressing certain facets of the Qur'an, intimate details. And you are trying to grasp and put them into your soul and flourish thereby. But we are a multi-dimensional existence, are we not? There is more to me than just the flesh and the blood and the, blo and the bones. Yes, I am skin. But at another point, I am soul. And soul is greater than the flesh and blood. So now at this point, because I am multi-dimensional, because there is at least two parts to me, at least there is these organs that are working in tangent, but there is this soul that is also present, I need to learn how to make both of these coexist at the same time. I need to learn to make these work in a way in which both of them are in unison. Let us show you an a'mal. I am speaking, you are listening. Whilst you are listening to me right now, talking, and I am saying these particular words, you can still be in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as well as being in the presence of this physical domain. Your physical may be sitting in whichever position you are sitting, looking at me. Your mind is ticking away. But the heart can be in another place with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the same time. Let us work on this for a second and understand nafs al mutma'inda practically. Now, as I am speaking to you, pick a dhikr of your own choice. I will not burden you with one. But let me show you different dhikrs. There is tahleel. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. The commander of the faithful has a narration whereby he says, the greatest dhikr one can do is to recite 100 times in the day, La ilaha illallah. The only thing better than to recite it 100 times is to recite it 101 times. Meaning that once you have done 101, you go to? Yes? So the best dhikr is La ilaha illallah. Then you can recite the salawat as a dhikr. There is an evident tradition that shows us the value of going to salawat as a dhikr. We have known that Ibrahim salam traverses the various degrees of stations before his Lord. He starts as an abd. He becomes a nabi. He moves to being rasul. He gets to the point of being khalil. And then he rises to the station of being an imam. How did he get to the station of Imam? We're here by his sacrifice as to what he does with Ismail alayhi salam. How did he get to the station of Khalil, brothers and sisters? By reciting the salawat upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad constantly. Oh. I will raise you to the point of being my Khalil on the basis that you recite salawat constantly. Now, pick this Dhikr, alhamd, subhan, alhamdulillah, whatever. Right now, do it in your minds and continue to do it. Don't stop, continue to do it. Even though I am talking to you, you are not losing anything from the discussion. Your mind is still capable of understanding what I am saying to you. But there is still a point where you are able to converse with your Lord at the very same time. Do you see that? You are multidimensional. You are not one facet to a human being. Right now, if you're still carrying on and haven't forgotten to do it, you are still listening to me, but you are still engaging with your Lord at all times. Now this, to be in a constant momentum of dhikr at all times, is not an easy thing to achieve. But, as with everything, it takes practice. Did you not learn to walk and fall and graze your knee and stand up and take another step until you were able to run? But it took you practice and practice until you were capable of doing it. Did you not ride that bike and fall off the first time? Did you not drive that car and hopefully it didn't crash? Did you not drive that car and eventually learn how to perfect that skill? Did you not become accountants and doctors and engineers and pharmacists and lawyers and so on and so forth on the basis that you practiced the knowledge that you were learning? Now, are you still doing dhikr? Good, mashallah. Yes? There is two sides to you. You can listen. Your brain is so capable. It is greater than any supercomputer. 
by Allah, it is Allah who has created the brain and therefore surely it is greater than what we can create. Your brain is capable of listening and your heart is able to converse with your Lord at the same time. Now the challenge is to practice this until you get to the point where you're in constant sync with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do you get there? By improving. When you go to the gym, you start with just the bar. Or maybe I started with just the bar. And then you add certain weights. Eventually you get to the point where you have all the weights sitting on there and you're able to push and push and push. Similarly, you add slowly. Right now, practice a little bit. But later, at some point, when you are driving home tonight, you know that there is a certain distance between the mosque and home. You know you will have to go a certain number of Stops. You have to go a certain number of red lights. You have to go a certain number of junctions on that very long road from Safa to Marwa, which we call up towards Long Island. As you go through that particular road, stop yourself and say, I am now at junction 30. I am going to remain in a state of dhikr until I'm at junction 32. And once you get to 32, if you have forgotten and stopped, then you need to repractice that. And once you have perfected to the point of going that period of time, then increase it and increase it and increase it until you're at the point that every part and parcel of you is in a constant state of dhikr. Does that make sense? Practical amal, what we can take away. I promise you, I promise you, sitting on this blessed pulpit with these blessed alams around us, you practice this, you will reach new heights within yourself that have never been fathomed. Let me share with you an example. Ayatollah al adama al-Sheikh Muhammad Taqib Bahjat. May Allah bless his soul. It is not in need of me to express to you how high Sheikh Bahjat really was. But maybe if you have not heard this name, if my youth have not come across this man, I will say to you, having concluded this story, not only will you be in awe, but it will be almost compulsory for you to find stories about him on the internet. Ayatollah Bahjit is said to be the most foremost spiritual master of our generation. Maybe we cannot put a number and a rank on it, but if there was a pyramid, surely he would sit at the very peak of that pyramid. Ayatollah Bahjit was a student. At this point, it is his exit exams. He is on the point of kharij. He is learning to be a mujtahid. He is at the very peak of jurisprudential lessons. So at this point, he would enter into his classroom and he would sit and of course his teacher would be sitting and discussing with him. His other students would sit alongside him as per normal and they would sit in their dars. They may sit in a circle and have their books and they would listen to the teacher. They would engage in discussion and debate. It got to the point where it was so evident that Sheikh Bahjit was so far and high above in terms of jurisprudential caliber of the rest of his students that when he would speak, he would always get the right answer. He would always challenge and create a new angle. The students noticed that they were so far behind that they didn't even understand certain lessons. So they decided amongst themselves, rather than embarrassing ourselves in front of our teacher, we will wait for the lesson to conclude. We will go back to the house of Ayatollah Bahjit. We will sit with him and ask him to explain the lesson to us. So the story picks up at this point. Class has finished. Ayatollah Bahjit goes home. The students follow. And of course you can imagine the Hawza. It is a large block of rooms. People share rooms in multiplicity with each other. So these particular groups of students enter into the room of Ayatollah Bahjit. Ayatollah Bahjit is lying down asleep on the bed. Ayatollah Bahjit is where? He is lying down asleep on the bed. Unconscious, asleep on the bed. The students engage with Ayatollah Bahjit. They start asking him those questions. What did Sheikh X say about this? We didn't understand this particular word. We didn't know this particular rule. Can you explain it to us? Ayatollah Bahjit is asleep on his bed and he is responding to them, giving them the answers. At the end of that session, Ayatollah Bahjit wakes up 
And he says, what are you doing here, students? My fellow colleagues, what are you doing here? The students say, we came to seek knowledge from you about the events that took place in the class. We asked you questions and you gave us answers. But I was asleep. Indeed, Sheikh Bahja, you were asleep. But we asked and you gave the responses whilst you were asleep. How did he get to this point where his body and his soul can be at this point of complete unison with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? His body, his physical may be in one stage, but his soul is ascending to another stage. Do we not find that tradition from Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, where she says that I used to see Rasulullah sleep. By Allah, his eyes sleep, but his heart does not sleep. His eyes sleep sleep but his heart does not sleep he was in a constant state of conversation with his lord to the extent that even ayatollah bahjad may have just understood a drop within the ocean of what rasulullah was capable of imagine nafsul mutma'inna imagine that contented soul where no matter what happens to you no matter what trial and tribulation there is nothing in front of you except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does the commander of the faithful not say that wherever I turn, I see my Lord in front of me? There is nothing except that He is in it, after it, and before it. How do we get there? How do we strive to reach that stage of being a nafs that has completely mutma'in? We find that we need to traverse a number of stages, of course, and Someone as lowly as me doesn't have the ability to express them to you, but we will regurgitate what the scholars present to you, inshallah. We find that the first thing we really need to assume and create within ourselves is a point of absolute trust between ourselves and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There cannot be a moment where, one, I'm not separated from Him. We spoke, we've spoken about that now. Number two, I get to the point that whatever comes, whatever situation I find, there is nothing except the answer is sitting with my Lord. There is nothing except I am completely burning within the love that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a story that talks about this so beautifully. Fir'aun. The Fir'aun. Not Yazid this time. The Fir'aun at the time of Musa alayhi salam. Imagine the scene. Imagine part of Banu Israel... And they flee and they leave Fir'aun. As we know, the army of Fir'aun catch up to Banu Israel. They now get to the banks of that sea which is about to be parted. Now most people only know at this point, this story, that the river, uh, that the sea parted, that the Banu Israel went, and then eventually closed in upon the approaching Fir'aun and his Al. At this point, there is another story. There's a hadith that tells us another angle to this story. It says to us that there was a woman. She was also an enemy of Fir'aun, a very elderly lady. And she had gone down towards the banks of that sea, and she was washing her clothes. So she had a basket with her, and she had her clothes with her. And she's sitting in the, or at the, the, the point of the, the bank of the, the sea, and she's washing the clothes. As she's washing the clothes, she's doing du'a towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see the point? She's constantly in the state of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even when washing her clothes. Maybe even when she was, in our context, ironing. Even when she is putting her child to sleep. Even when she's making dinner. At all times, she's in a constant state of remembrance of Allah. So this woman is washing her clothes in the sea. She is pushing them in and out. At that point... The narration says that she's making du'a. Which du'a to Allah? She's saying, my Lord, you know the tyrant that is Fir'aun. I ask you to destroy Fir'aun for me. Fair du'a. May Allah destroy the tyrant and all tyrants. Indeed, she's making this du'a. But imagine the scene now, if you will. Imagine you were that woman. You were not part of Banu Israel directly. But yet you have been making this du'a. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so kind that he actually takes his mercy to the point where not only does he accept the du'a, he shows you the completion of the du'a in front of you. At that point, the Banu Israel arrive at that sea. Musa strikes the stick. The sea parts. He enters into it. Fir'aun and his al come approaching. 
they enter in towards that sea, it closes and engulfs upon them. That woman is staring, watching the entire scene before her eyes. Imagine that that takes place. Imagine how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reacted to that dua. Not only that he brings so many people's stories in that story all into one point. How much of a great planner is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That not only will he accept for Harun and Musa. Not only will he accept for Banu Israel. Not only will he come to a conclusion and show the Fir'aun who is the real Lord. But he will even do it in front of a person who is asking to see that destruction. He brings so many lives together at one point And shows them the conclusion of that story in front of all of them. Now, understand even us our own scenario every single day that we go through in our own lives. Look at our Lord. Take a step back and understand what our Lord really is. That grand creator and sustainer of what he truly is. We go, and I've heard this from someone else, so I'm regurgitating this, but this is so wonderful the way he explains. The scholar said, imagine now when you go and you ascend a lofty mountain and you go up to that mountain and eventually you get to the point that that mountain is completely filled with snow. Even there, even there, there are still creatures that are living and having to create and live their own lives. There are some creatures that when you ascend the mountains, that they are created in such a format that they are blind. They do not have the ability to see. So what Allah has created with them is very long beaks. And their very long beaks are created for the purpose of digging through the snow, parting the snow in order to get to the underground insects in order to eat those very insects as sustenance. Now imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a creator and as a sustainer. Is he not looking after every single one of those creatures? Has he not perfectly designed the system for that one insect to have a beak long enough to break through the ground? Has he not been the one who has placed below the ground that new insect in order so the one above the ground may feed from it? I as an individual am so oblivious as to the reality of what takes place within the universe. How Allah has constructed the system so finely. I don't even know the name of those creatures. Those very creatures that live underneath the ground. But each one of them is being looked after and sustained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows every single ant individually. He knows every single of those creatures individually. At that point when I come to realize his knowledge of even those ants. The fact that he looks after those ants. How can I second for a think that he doesn't look after me at every second within my life? Imagine Aba Abdullah sits on the plains of Arafah and he recites that dua of Arafah. What does he say? He says, My Lord, you are the one who looked after me in the womb. My Lord, when I was given birth to, you ensured that from that point in time there would be guidance for me so I would not go astray. Not only that, you looked after me to the point that you ensured that there was food and wholesome milk for me. Not only that, my Lord, that you ensured that the wet nurse was kind towards me. And then you put me in the bosom of a mother who was compassionate towards me. And then you made me grow up by age and by age and by age. And then you continue to give me bounty after bounty. And then you continue to bless me to the point where you completed me in strength. At that point, I was the one who rejected you. I had the audacity to fling sin towards you. And you continue to give and look after me. Not only that, when I was the one who turned towards you and asked, you gave. When I was the one who requested, you continued to give. When I was the one who was saying thank you, you were grateful for the thank you. And you were the one who increased everything thereby. If that is what Imam al Hussein says about his Lord and the way his Lord really is, how can I not have that complete and utter trust in my Lord that whatever situation takes me, no matter how good or how bad it gets, I am completely at one with my Lord because I know that He is dictating things in a way which can only complete my journey towards Him. 
That is nafsul mutma'inna. That is the complete satisfied soul that no matter what takes place, there is no complaint. There is nothing other than he in front of me. That is nafsul mutma'inna. That one is completely satisfied with everything that takes place. And then eventually, you break even that boundary. Eventually, that becomes a norm and that you get to another point. You get to the point where not only is your life covered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hand, and not only are you completely satisfied by Him, but you get to the point where everything in your life is dictated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hand. Where every action that you perform is in conformity with how it ought to be to achieve absolute perfection within the self. Again, another inspirational story for us to consider and appreciate. There is a scholar by the name of Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Rida Shirazi. May Allah bless his soul. He passed away only a couple of years ago. You can visit his grave in Karbala. For those of us who have been, may Allah take us this year and every year, when you go and you stand, imagine not for the sake of um, disrespect to the Master of the Martyrs, but imagine your back is facing the grave of the Master of the Martyrs. You are looking outwards now. Towards your left, as the haram circulates, as it goes around towards your left, that is where Ayatollah Shirazi is buried. Inshallah, we go there and recite a Surah Al-Fatiha for him. When you go there, Ayatollah Shirazi has a story. He says about his own father. His own father was a grand marja of the time, one of the highest people of emulation. Sayyid Muhammad Rida Shirazi narrates. He says, my father had a particular uh, uh, attitude or a particular series to the day that he would perform. He had a system to his day. That every day he would have students coming at a particular time and he would teach them. Now obviously being Grand Marja, he would only teach Kharaj students or such. He would teach the very highest of students. So he narrates specifically even the book that he would be teaching. So he says, my father used to teach and it was his custom that before students came to participate in the lesson, he would always spend maybe half an hour before the lesson preparing for that lesson. So he would open the book and he would sit, pen, pad, make notes, know what he was going to speak on, the angles, and be prepared. Whilst he was sitting, because the students knew that Sayyid Shirazi would be in this format, that he would be preparing and be sitting available in that half an hour before class started, a student of Ayatollah Shirazi burst through the door. He's in a state of... Shock. He's in a state of being unaware. He doesn't know what to do with himself. He's completely besides himself. He bursts through the door. Samahat Sayyid, your eminence Sayyid, I need to speak with you urgently. No problem, sit down, what can I do for you? He says to him, I have a problem. And the more I think about this problem, the more entangled I get with this problem. And the more entangled I get with this problem, the more I realize I do not have an answer for this problem. Therefore, I've got to the point where it is defeating me, and I need an urgent answer from you. Sayyid says, Tafadl, ask if I can help you in any way, I will give you an answer. He says, the question I have for you is, if you had one day to live, if you had 24 hours to live before Allah took your soul, what would you do with those final 24 hours? What a question. What a question to ask someone who is of nafsul mutma'inna. Here I'll break for a second and I want to pose the question to you. You don't need to answer it. Think about it for a second. Be truthful to yourself. What would you do if you had 24 hours to live? Would you have to perform qada? Many of us would. Would you have to perform istighfar? Many of us would. Would I have to put my will in order? Many of us would. Would I amend those broken relationships with my friends and family that I had cut off many years ago? Many of us would. What would I do in these final 24 hours if I knew I had them? And in fact, there are some people who know that they only have 24 hours to live. We have seen them sitting in their hospital beds knowing that they are about to be taken by their Lord. What would you do right now if you had 24 hours to live? So, Sayyid Shirazi is presented with this question. 
Sayyid, if you had 24 hours to live, what would you do? Give me an answer because I don't have a sufficient answer for myself. What takes precedent? What comes to the second priority? What should I leave? What should I hand to my eldest son? What do I need to do? Now the student narrates that when we used to ask Sayyid Shirazi a question, it was his norm that he would stop, bow his head, think for a good long period of time, and then raise his head to answer the question. For those of us who have had the blessing of meeting Sayyid Al-Khu'i, may Allah bless his soul, often did the same thing. Often did the same thing. Even a, a fairly simple question by, by his standard. He wouldn't, he wouldn't answer straight away. Why? Because he knew his tongue was going to be accountable for every letter and harakah that it was going to express. So Sayyid Shirazi had this very same aptitude about him. He would normally bow his head, maybe take 15 seconds, think of the answer, construct it in his mind, and then present it to his students. The student who is asking this question says, at this point in time, Sayyid Shirazi didn't bow his head, he answered me straight away, showing that he had already thought about this very same question and had an answer prepared within his heart. What answer did he give? What answer did this master give to his student? Let me tell you, he looks at his student straight away and says, By Allah, you would not find me doing anything different as to what you find me doing right now. You find me preparing to teach the students of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. If I had 24 hours to live, I would also be teaching the students of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Now understand the deeper reality of it. What was your answer and what was mine? Was mine that I had to make up qada? Sayyid Shirazi's wasn't. Was it that I had to rewrite my will? Sayyid Shirazi's wasn't. Was it that I had to go and seek forgiveness? Sayyid Shirazi's wasn't. I was prepared for death. If death came and took me 24 hours, I would be ready. If death took me in two hours, I would be ready. At that point, I am ready to meet with my Lord. There is no obligation left upon my shoulders. And that's how I can safely say, I am nafsul mutma'inna. If I am still the one that has obligations upon my shoulders, I cannot become a contented soul, can I? If I know that I still have to perform X, Y, and Z, if I still have to hand back this particular thing to this person, if I haven't yet fulfilled this, am I the contented and satisfied soul? By Allah, I am not. How would I be in that last pang of death? Except in a state of utter regret. I had not filled this. I had not finished this. I had not fulfilled those things I'd wanted to since when I was a child. I had wanted to go and see this place. I had wanted to read that book. I had wanted to go and sit with this person. Why did I procrastinate? Why did I sit in front of that TV? Why did I go towards this particular thing? Why did I waste that time when Allah said to me I had a certain amount of time? Do I want to die in that state? Is that the death that I really want? Do I want the angels to come at that point and say, I am taking your soul, and at that point say, I am not ready? As opposed to saying, my Lord, I have been waiting for you to come and take my soul. What difference there is in approach when I am nafsul mutma'inna? It is completely different, the outlook. Everything changes. Everything changes in my own way. Now here we conclude with a tradition from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a hadith of Qudsi. He describes what nafsul mutma'inna means to him. Subhanallah. Imagine, we've described it from our angle, our angle. It's very easy for me to say, become prepared for death when I'm the one who's not prepared for death. By the way, are you still doing dhikr? (laughs) So here, it becomes very easy for me to say that I can be ready for death and that we should be ready for death. But what about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's perspective on this same issue? As a hadith qudsi about nafsul mutma'inna. You know what he says? He says that when the angels are descending, when Malikul Mawt himself is descending to take the soul of the person who has reached the stage of nafsul mutma'inna, he says, O oh, angel, 
This is not your job. For the one who has reached the station of nafs al-mutma'inna, it is for me to come and take his soul. At that point, he continues and says, I bring forth the heavens. Do you see the link, the parallel? In this verse we said, Allah brings forth the hellfire. In this side of the coin, he says, I bring forth the heaven. I tell the heavens, decorate yourself for this nafs al-mutma'inna. I tell the heavens in the Hur al-Ain, prepare yourself for the coming of this person. And then I tell the trees within the heavens to adorn yourself with fruits. I tell the gates, all the gates of heaven to open. And whichever one that nafs al-mutma'inna decides to enter into, allow him to enter into that particular gate. At that point, I, Allah, take the soul of nafs al-mutma'inna and I tell him, enter into my Jannah. فَدْخُلِي fi ibadi. I tell him, enter into my Jannah. That is nafsul mutma'inna. That is the regions in which we are striving for. There is no reason as to why any of us cannot achieve that. Don't for a second think that I hear that story of Ayah Bahjat and it's only for him. And I hear Ayah Shirazi and it's only for him. No, no. Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create you and me unless he wanted all of us to reach that stage? And therefore with his infinite justice and mercy, would he not be calling all of us towards that very same path? It only happens with the same level of effort that you and I put into all of our academia, the same level of effort we put into our businesses, the same level of effort I can put into my soul and imagine the response I will get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is nafsul mutma'inna. This is nafsul mutma'inna where everything falls at the feet of the human being. And instead of me saying, Paradise, allow me to enter into you, Paradise opens its arms and says, We desire your presence to come into us. This is nafsul mutma'inna, where everything changes, where the game changes, where the outlook changes, where everything becomes for him and him alone. Him and him alone. (coughs) Let us repeat that. Him and him alone. The master of the martyrs. Tenth of Muharram is upon us. The tenth of Muharram was upon the master of the martyrs. On the tenth of Muharram, nafsul mutma'inna manifests itself like no other. Maybe this verse was revealed solely for him. Maybe there cannot be another nafsul mutma'inna. Maybe we are all grasping at just the cloak of nafsul mutma'inna and saying, my master, take me with you, take me with you. That very same master, can we go with the lights? That very same master, he is on the 10th of Muharram. That very same master is on the 10th of Muharram. The swords are striking this individual. The arrows are flinging itself at him. And at one point, he stops and looks towards the heavens and says, My Lord, have I fulfilled my promise? There is no response. The heavens do not respond back to him. Abu Abdullah again picks up that sword and fights on. And again, he stops a few minutes later and cries out, My Lord, have I fulfilled my promise to you? Again, there is no response. A third time, he continues to fight and fight and fight. And again, he looks to the heavens and says, My Lord, have I fulfilled my promise? Again, there is no response from the heavens. O Hussein, fight on. Fight on and continue fighting. Hussein is engaged with the wolves of the Fir'aun. And they continue to strike at him with every sword and every spear. One man comes and thrusts a spear into his chest. One comes with an arrow and thrusts it into his abdomen. One enemy takes a dagger and thrusts it into the thigh of Hussein. Hussein falls to the floor. And at that point, again, he raises his head and says, My Lord, have I fulfilled my covenant with you? This time, this time, a voice can be heard from the very heavens. At this time, that response comes, O Hussein, you have fulfilled your covenant with me, but I am fulfilling my covenant with you, that every man, woman, and child that falls in love with you, I will forgive him and her. 
This is Hussein ibn Ali, nafs al mutmainna That even at that point, he wondered about Allah. Even when the arrows were striking him, he wondered about Allah. Before we move to Ali al Azhar, it is imperative we understand the tragedy of the night of Ashura. Burn in the pain that is with Hussein ibn Ali tonight. Understand what it must have been like on that night to be with him. We start with a tradition that speaks of the anguish of Sayyida Zainab on the night of Ashura. She leaves her tent and she wants to head towards the tent of her brother Hussein. And as she approaches the tent of Hussein, she sees that there is no one guarding him. You see, normally there would be guards waiting in case the wolves came and attacked during the night. Where are you, Akbar? Where are you, Abbas? She looks towards the tent and she sees there is no one guarding it. Disappointed, she walks in towards that tent. What does she see? She sees her brother Hussein in a state of sajda. Nafsul mutmainna. She begins to cry at this scene of the intimate love that is shown between this master and his slave. At that point, she hears some murmurings. She goes towards the tent where she hears the murmurings. And she hears that it is Abu Fadr Abbas himself. Abbas is surrounded by Banu Hashim. It is as if that he is the sun and they are the moon circumambulating Abbas on that night. And at that point, she begins to hear that Abbas is dictating a speech to them. O oh, Banu Hashim, O oh, sons of Ahlul Bayt, tomorrow is the day of Ashura. I am telling you that all of you must go out and defend Hussein ibn Ali, your master. None of you must survive. But I also tell you that us, as the sons of Muhammad, must go out first into the battlefield, even before the companions of Hussein. Because we do not want anyone in history to say that Hussein preferred his companions or preferred his family over his companions. We must go out first. Zainab is brought to tears again. What loyal companions I have. What loyal companions will be there for my brother tomorrow? And at that point she leaves and she goes past another tent and she hears murmurings within another tent. Look at how Nafsul Mutmainna is being presented by each and every one of these people. And at that point she hears another tent. This time it is Habib ibn Mudahir leading the discourse. He has the companions situated around him. They are listening to Habib. Habib says almost the same words. O oh, Ashab of Hussein, O oh, great Sahaba, tomorrow is the tenth of Muharram. We expect that all of you give your lives, but all of you must give your lives first, so that no one in history says that we did not give our lives before Banu Hashim. <coughs> Again, Zainab is brought to tears by this scene. She leaves, and en route back towards her tent, she meets with her brother, the master of the martyrs. O oh, Hussein, let me recount to you what scene I have just come across. She begins to tell him, O oh, Hussein, are you satisfied with your family and your companions? Do you know their intention for tomorrow? Hussein says, O oh, dear sister, shall I show you what the intention is of my companions? Hussein stands aloft. He calls out, O oh, Banu Hashim, come towards me. Banu Hashim run out of their tent and stand in front of their master. He calls out, O oh, Ashab of Hussein, come towards me, I summon you. All of the Ashab leave and come towards Aba Abdullah. All the companions are standing before their master. Master, why did you summon us? What did you want from us? What can we do from you? What can we do for you? He responds and says, O oh, my family and friends, I lift the oath of allegiance from each and every one of you. Depart in the night. Run as far as you can away. They are only after my blood. If they want me, let them take me. All of you can go. Each and every one of the companions, each and every one of the family members unsheathes their sword and puts it towards their own neck. By Allah, we would rather strike off our own necks than desert you, O Hussein. What will happen tomorrow? 
Tell me of your intentions then, O companions. The first to raise his voice is Muslim ibn Awsaja. Muslim responds by saying, O Hussein, I tell you of my own stance, that I swear that tomorrow we will attack the enemies with our swords. And that when our swords break, we will attack them with our spears. When our spears break, we will attack them with daggers. When our daggers break, we will attack them with our stones. When we do not have any stones left, we will attack them with our bare hands. When they come towards us and cut off our arms, we will come towards them and scream at them. When they cut us dead, we will still call out. When they cut us into pieces, we will still want to be with you. If they cut us into pieces, we will still want to be with you. With you. Oh Hussein, at that point, if they burn our body into ashes, we will still want to be with you. At that point, if they scatter our ashes in the air, even at that point, we will pray to Allah to raise us a thousand times to come back and die for you. This is Nafsul Mutma'inna. That was the companions. At that point, at that point, Hussein is enamored with the companions that are around him. He lets them go into their tents and engage in that one last night that they have with their Lord and their Creator. Hussein leaves the tent. Hussein enters into the battlefield. It is the pitch of night, and he is spending time on his own. He is observing the plains of Karbala. One of the companions follows him out. Every step he takes, he follows him. And at this point, Hussein turns round and says to him, My companion, what is it that you want from following me? The companion says, I followed you, lest you be attacked in the darkness of the night. He says, Come with me, come stand with me, and let us walk together. At this point, Hussein walks with his companion, but as he comes to a point, he stops and he breaks down in a flood of tears. Oh my master Hussein, why do you cry like this? Oh my master Hussein, why do you cry like this? I cry because at this point, this will be where Shah Qasim falls. And when he calls out for me, I will not be able to aid him. And at this point, when I see his body lying on the floor, the horse's hooves will trample over his broken body. Hussein continues to walk on. Again, he stops and he begins to weep. Oh, Hussein, why are you crying at this point? He says, this is the place in which my Akbar will fall. They will thrust a dagger in towards his chest. The spearhead will break off and it will be embedded into his chest. How will I bear when my Akbar falls at this place? He continues to walk and he gets to another place. This time he falls towards the floor and cries out profusely. And then his companion says, where are we now? He says, this is the place where my Abbas will be struck down. And then he comes to another and he begins to cry like he has not cried before. Oh, Hussein, why are you crying now? This will be the place in which they will thrust a three-headed, a three-headed arrow into the neck of my Asghar. And then he continues to walk and he stops at a place and he looks down. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Oh my master Hussein, why are you saying these words? Why are you crying here at this point? Oh my dear companion, this is the place in which Shimmer will sit on my chest. This is the place in which he will remove my head from my shoulders. This is the place in which he will lift my head up high. At that point, the companion says, At this point, the companion narrates that I heard the cries of a woman. I heard the cries of a woman so loudly. I began to hear her shriek and I began to hear her cry out. At that point, I turned towards my master Hussein and said, Oh Hussein, what is this cry that I hear from the voice of a woman? Hussein says, Oh my companion, that is my mother Fatima. She is here at this point in which I will fall. You are hearing the cries of my mother Fatima at this point. 
Imagine Hussein ibn Ali alone now on the 10th of Muharram. His Qasim has gone. Own in Muhammad no more. Akbar has departed from him. Even Abu Fadl Abbas has left him now. He stands alone in front of the enemy ranks. He calls out, Hal min nasirin yansurina? Hal min mughithin yughithuna? O oh people, rise towards that call. Is there anyone out there who will come towards the aid of the, the grandson of Rasulullah? Who will come to the aid of the women folk of the household of Rasulullah? At that point, he hears that there is a cry that has not been heard before from the tents. He turns round and says, O oh Zainab, due to the thirst, has one of the children died within the tent? O oh Hussein, your son Azghar heard that very call and he is moving within his cradle as if to say, O oh Hussein, if you crawl out again for aid, I will fling myself towards you in order to assist you in your mission. O oh Hussein, he is the one who is so thirsty. O oh Hussein, take a look at this dear babe of yours. His tongue is so dry. He does not have the ability to even cry out. O oh Hussein, his eyes have sunk into the back of his own skull. Hussein, his mother, does not have any milk to give to him. Take this child so he may be presented and get one sip of water for this young babe. At this point, Hussein ibn Ali takes this young child. He wraps him in his Abba. Why? Because the heat of the Iraqi desert would have killed this young child. He takes this young babe out in front of the enemies. What do they do? They mock Hussein ibn Ali. They say, Oh Hussein, have you now come in a desperate situation? Do you want to use the Quran? to be a means of arbitration for us. Hussein says, no, this is not the Qur'an. This is the speaking Qur'an. This is bidhibhin adheem I am presenting in front of you. There is a narration that says that when Ismail was about to be slaughtered and that ram was placed in front of him and when Ibrahim took off that cloth that was covering his eyes, he looked down and saw that his young son was still alive. He smiled with joy. At that point, Jibrail said to him, O oh Ibrahim, do you want to know what it must have been like to give away your own child? He says, yes, let me understand stand at that point. He says, look between those two trees. At that point, the veils were lifted. And at that point, he sees the vision of Hussein ibn Ali in his arms of the six-month-old babe, Ali ibn Razgar. The arrow is flying through the air. At that point, Ibrahim knew what it meant to be giving his son in sacrifice. Hussein ibn Ali stands in front of the enemies. He brings that babe. This is not a Qur'an. This is a young, innocent child. O oh, enemies, if you have any quarrel with me, if you think that I have done you any injustice, then indeed your fight is with me. Why do you torture this young child? He is innocent of any crime. Give him some water. They did not give him any water. At this point, Point. He says, if that is the case, then I say to you, that if you think I am going to drink the water, you come with your own hands, put it into the mouth of this young babe and quench his thirst. Again, they do not respond. He says, if that is the case, I will leave this child upon the burning plains of Karbala. You come here and come and give him some water. I will stand away from this young babe. Even then he did not give and even then they did not give him any water. I say to you, O Ismail, even if your feet have placed the grounds of Karbala, in the same way Ismail struck his feet, and that water would have gushed forth, even for your feet the plains of Karbala would have gushed forth with water. At this point, they continue to look at Hussein. 
They begin to cry. They begin to weep and understand that even they are fathers. Even they have young children. How can we allow this young child to go without water? At this point, there is a state of tumult in the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad. Umar realizes there just might be a riot within his own army. They might turn away from this. They are crying so much. At this point, he turns turns towards Hormala. He says, O oh, Hormala, cut off the speech of Hussein. Cut off the words of Hussein. Stop that movement that is taking place within our camp. At this point, we hear a maktal that says that when Hormala, he was captured and he was about to be killed, they asked him, tell us about the arrows that you flung on the tent of Muharram. He says, I struck a number of arrows in the tent of Muharram. I struck the arrow that embedded the eye of Abu Fadl Abbas. I struck that arrow that entered into the chest of Abdullah ibn Hassan al Mujtaba. I struck that arrow that embedded itself into the heart of Hussein ibn Ali. And I struck that arrow that entered into the neck of that six month old baby. Hormala, I want you to cut off the speech of Hussein ibn Ali. Hormala takes that first arrow. He begins to quiver and shake. Oh Hormala, you are the master marksman. Why do you shake and quiver at this time? I see a woman who is standing outside her tent. She is eagerly awaiting to receive the news of her child. Oh Hormala, set this aside. Put the arrow. He again puts the arrow again he cannot strike it I see this woman she is running up and down she is waiting to hear some news put this aside cast this aside Hormala take the sharpest of arrows which arrow did Hormala take he took a three pronged arrow do you know why they used to use three pronged arrows in Arabia there were two reasons the first one was when they wanted to break into to a door, they would strike that arrow into the door, knowing that it would pierce the door. The second reason is when they wanted to kill a camel, they would use a three-pronged arrow to strike it at the neck of a camel. Oh brothers and sisters, oh mothers and fathers, I ask you, how big and strong is the neck of a camel and how soft was the neck of Ali Azhar? How small was the neck of Ali in al That babe, he is waiting for that thirst to be quenched. Hormala pulls back that arrow. He lines it up. He lets go of the arrow. The arrow flies through the air. Hussein ibn Ali watches on. He sees this arrow approaching. It lands into the tender neck of that babe. The neck of Ali in al as God is struck open. He is cut from ear to ear. The neck of Ali Asghar is bleeding upon himself. Ali Asghar's head falls back. His head is hanging from his own neck. His head is only attached by a little bit of skin from his own neck. At that point, he's still with a moment of life left within him. As any babe would do, he struggles for that last bit of breath. His arms wail, his arms fling about, his arms are flapping like a bird. At that point, he looks into the eyes of his father as if to say, Father, they did not quench my thirst, but with a three-pronged arrow. Father, how will you bear at this point? Hussein ibn Ali loses all stage of consciousness. Oh, Azgar, Wazgara, Wazgara. He even calls out, Wa Aliya. Were you calling out for Ali Azgar? Or were you calling out for Ali Murtada? Oh, Hussein, even Ali al Murtada cannot bear this scene. Even he cannot see Azgar's neck falling from his own head. 
At this point, at this point, the arms begin to flail. At this point, the earth begins to shake. At this point, the skies begin to shake. The earth is trembling under this tragedy. At this point now, Hussein gets the blood of Asghar. He looks towards the sky. Oh skies, may I give you this blood as sacrifice to take? The skies respond, oh Hussein, we swear by everything that if one drop of blood reaches us, we will never reign again. There is no mercy from us for humanity. Oh earth, let me give you one drop of blood. Oh earth, one drop of blood, take this from this tragedy. The earth responds, oh Hussein, we cannot bear this. We will never grow another crop again if this is the place. What can Hussein do? What can Hussein do except put his blood of his six month old babe upon himself? He wipes his face and his beard with that blood. He pours the blood upon his own self. He turns back, oh Hussein, there is a mother who is waiting to hear news of a six month old child. What news do you have of this young babe? At this point, he walks back towards the camp. He begins to recite, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajirun radam bikadaihi. He begins to walk. At this point, he cannot bear to see what this mother's reaction would be. He walks and turns back towards the enemies. Imagine, he now has to show the enemies again what they have done. He walks back towards the tents. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajirun. He continues seven times back and forth, back and forth. How do I tell a mother that her son, she does not have a son anymore. She has two parts to her son. How do I tell a mother that she has two parts to her son now to take? At this point, he walks back towards the camp. Sukaina, Sakina, the young daughter, Sakina, the four-year-old child, runs out to greet her father. Oh, father, did they quench the thirst of my brother Asghar? Hussein falls to the floor. He extends his arms. Oh, Sakina, look at what they did to your brother. Sakina, take your brother. I do not have the strength to bear this anymore. Take your brother from me. Allow me to grieve for my young son. Sakina takes that babe. At that point, the women hear the crying of Hussein. They gather. They surround themselves. They look at this brown babe. What did they do to you, my young child? What did they do to you, my young child? How did they quench your thirst? And at this point, we ask you, how did Hussein ibn Ali bear this? He now comes and he has to bury this young babe. Why did he bury this young babe? Why did he not bury the others? Because he did not want the spears to come towards his six-month-old child. He comes and I ask you, how small must that grave have been? And how long did it take for him to bury? How long must it have taken? for him to dig that very grave. He sits and he begins to dig within the sand. He puts that babe within the sand. But we hear in Maktal, we hear in Maktal that that babe is not resting alone. No, the young child always loves to be in the arms of his father. When it cries, the father extends its arms and says, Come to Papa. Come, let me be the one to put you to sleep. Oh, Asghar, you are asleep now. At this point, we hear that Asghar is lying on the chest of his father as to where he is buried because a six-month-old child loves to be in the arms of his father.